Arthur Brooks wrote The Battle, which argues that a fight between free enterprise and big government will shape our future. The way that our culture is moving now is toward more redistribution, toward more progressive taxation, exempting more people from paying anything and loading more of the taxes onto the very top earners in our society. But I'm wealthy. It's kind to take it away from me and give it to people who need it more. Actually, it's not. The government does not create wealth. It uses wealth that's been created by the private sector. Americans are in open rebellion today because the government is threatening to take us from a maker nation into taker nation status. A taker nation? Well, there are plenty of takers. I'll introduce you to one when we come back. Some people say either you're a maker or a taker. And today the makers and takers are battling for America's soul. It's a battle because we're deciding on our culture. 60% of Americans take more out of the public finance system than they pay in. They get more in public services than they pay in taxes. How do you give a rebate to people that didn't put any bait in? There are makers and there are takers. And I live the life of a taker. Star Parker was a taker. She lived off welfare for seven years. She says the welfare bureaucracy encouraged her to stay dependent. And on the form, they just made sure that you didn't work, you didn't save, and you didn't get married. And if you didn't work or save or marry, you got a check. Right. Two and checks. First and the 15th. <laughs> and let's go Food back. stamps, too. And all your medical expenses paid and all the daycare for your kids so I can hang out at Venice Beach all afternoon. So she did. The creators of welfare meant well, meant to help people. But handouts have unintended consequences. But once I found out about welfare, why work when I can hang out out here? This was fabulous, you know? Even if welfare encouraged dependency, Thank progressives you. say, other programs don't. We have things like public housing. We have all sorts of things that are designed not to give people just a handout, but to give people a fighting chance. A fighting chance? So many people vandalized their public housing projects that governments ended up destroying them. Again. And again. They build it, it wrecks neighborhoods, and then they blow it up. Public housing doesn't wreck neighborhoods. Unattended public housing wrecks neighborhoods. When we look at the best moments of public housing, like the Taylor Homes early in the you know, 1960s in Chicago, uh, they worked out just fine. Fine? Government programs do often start nicely. But within 15 years, the Taylor Homes were a crime-ridden, graffiti-covered wreck. The drugs are on them. The government's solution? Once again, demolish the entire project. And yet, the left wants more handouts. I think that the basic affordances of democratic citizenship are housing, health care, and education. We have to make sure that... What happened to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? That's like secret code for housing, health care, and education. It seems to me... Well, but that's a big step beyond. You can't have life, liberty, and happiness if you, if you don't have access to a hospital. You can't have it if you don't have access to a basic education. Those but if you rights. leave people alone to have life, liberty, and to pursue their own happiness. That's different from taking money from one group of people to give other people housing and health care. First of all, we're not giving people housing and health care. And people pay taxes. Even people who live in public housing pay taxes. What we're doing, again, is creating an investment. We're not teaching dependency? No, I think that you, can, you, can, you always run the risk of intergenerational laziness. But I don't think that the welfare state necessarily means that. But it does, says Star Parker. It's so much easier to take than to make. I think that that's one of the greatest tragedies of becoming a taker, is you don't think about that somebody else had to make this, and you don't think about You're what if I tried on my own. I was just entitled to it. Entitled to a nice apartment on a tree-lined street with a balcony. And I had a fireplace, I had a spa in the back. And I had Stories like hers uh, drove the push for welfare reform. Today we are taking an historic chance to make welfare what it was meant to be. A second chance, not a way of life. Some people predicted trauma we haven't known since the cholera epidemics. Families will fracture. A million children could be forced into poverty. There would be people starving in the streets. Nobody starved. The record numbers of people that were on there just left the welfare system and nobody died. Star Parker found jobs. And I started a little magazine and it began to grow over time. She never returned to welfare. Most people went and got jobs and 
some went and um, went home, apologized to their mom, and moved in and started over, got back in the school. Other, uh, folks started thinking about their own life again. Nearly two million children rose out of poverty. Welfare caseloads fell by half. Yet that success hasn't convinced politicians that handouts hurt people. It's so essential to pass the unemployment insurance extension. Unemployment benefits used to last 26 weeks, but Congress has extended them to nearly two years. That does encourage dependency. It did encourage me to pass up open uh, job openings that I could have applied for. How many? Uh, probably half a dozen. Patrick Berry lost his job writing software manuals. He says his 99 weeks of unemployment benefits let him to turn jobs down because they paid less than unemployment. That would amount to a pay cut, and why would I want to do that? Fresno, California has 17 percent unemployment. Yet people who run employment agencies here tell us people turn down jobs all the time. We call them for a position and they say, no thanks, I'm on unemployment. A lot of people take advantage to try to work the system. If the state's going to give me money, why not take it? Unemployment agencies say many people just pretend to look for work. Better health personnel, this is Nancy, may I help you? They pretend because that's required to get your check. Yes, we do. They're, you know, completely not dressed for an interview in shorts, a t-shirt, and flip-flops saying, oh yeah, I want to get a job really bad, please hire me. And they'll come through the interview process and we know that they're not going to go to work. I would say maybe 25 to 35 percent of the people that we're talking to are just not trying. That's not what we hear from our president. I haven't met any American who would rather have an unemployment check than a meaningful job that lets you provide for your family. But incentives matter. In Denmark, the socialist government once offered laid-off workers five years of unemployment benefits. When did many Danes finally find work? Surprise, after exactly five years. So Denmark cut benefits to four years. Then Danes found jobs in four years. This year, Denmark cut the benefits in half. A survey found that one-third of the unemployed find work immediately when their unemployment benefits run out. When there were only a few weeks left, I actually did start looking at jobs that I had been passing up the chance to apply for. We should have a safety net to help people who cannot help themselves. But I don't think we ought to have a safety net that lulls people into lives of complacency and dependency in the federal government. Again, it is kind to want to help people who've fallen in hard times. But government handouts encourage people to rely on handouts instead of on themselves. Coming up, the alternative. What makes you happy? Money? Well then, what could be better than winning a lottery? Look at those big smiles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but here's the surprise for most. A few months later, they're not happier at all. On the contrary, the lottery winners are less happy. When people don't earn their own success, they're not as happy, they're not as healthy, and ultimately... Arthur Brooks wrote a book about happiness. What do you mean? They're not as happy? No, they're I not as happy. It would make you happy to get a check. <laughs> it would seem, but actually it's not true. Earned success is really the elixir of joy in an entrepreneurial society. People who accomplish things. Exactly. People who earn their success. People like Jesse Walter. I teach kids to cook. She runs Cupcake Kids, right, so a business that does cooking events for kids. <laughs> Here she's teaching them how to make zucchini muffins. What do you think? Doesn't it smell really good? Walter lost a job on Wall Street when the housing bubble burst. But she didn't mope and ask for a handout. She thought about what she could do next. I was like, I could do this. You know, I could teach kids to cook. Now we've built a kitchen. While helping herself, she helped others. Not just the kids. She created jobs. Yep. We have an events manager, a kitchen manager. How does this look? Awesome. I work more than I did, if that's believable. And despite that, she says she's happier. I love it, and it's, you know, every day's different. These are the happiest people, and those are the people who are most rewarded most of the time by the free enterprise system. A recent Gallup poll found business owners have a higher sense of well-being, even though they work longer hours and make less money. There's an enormous causal relationship between how much success that you think you've earned and how happy you are, and if that is followed by money, so much the better. I live in Janesville, Wisconsin. I can think of about 10 entrepreneurs off the top of my head who started with nothing, who have made great businesses, and they look at this as the American dream. One of those entrepreneurs is Ralph Tanuta. Hi. Hi, Mr. Hi, how are you? He started this deli with his father. 
He bought this little candy store. In 60 years, they grew it into a famous Wisconsin super deli. 